so very probably set its view. There will be another one coming. And um, I don't know if anyone has tried to download notes or look at the videos. Has anyone tried? Yeah, everything's right. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. So the last time we were reviewing uh, some of the fundamentals of quantum optics, and in particular, uh, looking at the Glauber theory of quantum coherence, in which these normally ordered products play an important role. In particular, here we're talking about uh, looking at proton counting and um, the joint rate of coincidences for photoelectric counts. And in the full quantum theory, that is determined by this expectation value of normal reordered products of the intensity operator associated with photo detections happening at those and space-time points, okay? I mean, really we have to put in some other units if we really want to make this a rate rather than a product of intensities, but we don't typically worry about that until we really have to, okay? And from the point of view of <coughs> classical statistical optics, the, the corresponding object that would correspond to the product of the photocurrents that come out of those photodetectors is just that product of the intensities incident on those averaged over ensemble average. Okay? Or as we've discussed, it could be uh, correspondingly a time average for the case of light that is ergodic and has stationary statistics. Well, actually, in this case, it's just the ergodicity that matters. And that's kind of a separate point at the moment. OK, but the most important uh, conclusion we want to draw related to all of that is that within the context of the fundamental theory, of quantum theory, the classical theory is a subset of the kind of things that can happen in quantum mechanics. And classical physics is, in some sense, a subset. Quantum physics. Yeah, but uh, we can define as such those sets of quantum states for which the, the quantum Glauber correlation function reduces to this classical expression. And the set of states for which that is true are the states which are statistical mixtures of coherent states. So I've written here something slightly more general than I wrote last time, is that I'm allowing for a multi-mode coherent state. So every coherence, there's a, a set of modes, each which has uh, an eigenvalue alpha for that mode. Okay, so on the uh, k mode, this is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator with eigenvalue alpha for that kth mode, okay? And we then have some probability distribution. And if this is an honest to God probability distribution, then we would say that this represents classical light, okay? And importantly, as we discussed, Physically, these are the states that arise from classical current. So if we ignore, if we treat the, the current that radiates the electromagnetic field as a classical field, and do that within the context of quantum electrodynamics, 
then the resulting state is this, as we showed last semester. Okay? So classical current yields what we're calling classical fields. Um, now, I just mentioned again, this function more generally is called the glauber sudarshan P representation. And as we'll see in a, uh, in a few weeks, we can think about whether, in general, we could try to write any quantum state in this form. One's an arbitrary quantum state of any kind of the electromagnetic field. We can try to do that, but what we will see is that generally P will be negative at some values of uh, alpha, or even worse, horribly singular, like multiple derivatives of a delta function, or something like that. In which case, it's really not an honest to God probability distribution. And so we cannot interpret those states, those quantum states of the electromagnetic field, as classical states. And signatures of non classicality then are related to the fact that this can be negative. And we're going to come back to that because it's a very important point in my opinion. It's a potentially the most fundamental question in quantum mechanics, which is, is quantum mechanics just classical mechanics with negative probabilities? And what the heck does that mean anyway? We'll come back to that, just a little foreshadowing. All right. Um, so, let's remind ourselves a little bit about uh, some of the ways in which what kind of constraints on phenomena that we would observe are implied under this condition. So if the, the state of the electromagnetic field is represented in this way with a positive probability distribution, then there are certain consequences. And that's one of the ways we can look for signatures does it put on certain phenomena? One thing we saw last semester um, is the question of photon counting statistics. So for example, we can look at, a, let's restrict our attention for the moment to a single mode. And I ask, if I do photon counting, um, what is the fluctuation that I would see in the number of counts, say, in an interval? As we've discussed, you might, just to remind you, you might say, what the heck are you talking about? photon counting and classical light. But as we discussed, the whole business of counting through the photoelectric effect can be understood completely in terms of classical light if we treat the matter quantumly. Okay? We will still see discrete events, and there will be fluctuations in those events. Okay? Now, this, of course, is equal to Okay. 
Now, when dealing with uh, a state of light expressed in terms of the P representation, then I just remind you that the expected value of any operator in this is equal to the trace of the state with the operator, which can be expressed when rho is written in terms of the P representation as the weighted average of expectation values of the operator for a given coherent state averaged over the statistical mixture of coherent states. That makes sense, right? That's what we mean. That's what it means to be a statistical mixture. So given this, it's when we have expectation values of operators with respect to coherent states, we want to, when possible, reorder the operator so that everything is in normal order. Because, so this is just a little aside over here. If I look at the expectation value of some function of A and A dagger, but normally ordered, meaning that all of the A daggers are put on the left and all of the A's are put on the right, okay, then this is equal to this. Why is that true? I mean, I just have to replace all the A daggers with alpha star and all the A's with alpha, whatever function I have, and I could just replace the operators by the C numbers. Yeah. Because all the A's go right, all the A daggers go left. A's can act on alpha, A daggers can act on graph. Excellent. Thank you. So, indeed, so as we remember, this is true, and thus, this is true. And so, if all the A daggers are on the left and all the A's are on the right, I just, every time I see an A dagger, I replace it by alpha star. Every time I see an A, I replace it. So that's a very important piece of algebra that we're going to use a lot as time goes on. Now, these operators are not normally ordered. Some of the A daggers lie to the right of some of the A's. So that's not a normally ordered operator. However, I can use the commutators to write that operator as a sum of normally ordered operators. Okay? So an, a, another aside here to remind you is that uh, n squared, which I wrote explicitly out, how would I normally order that? Well, I have to commute all the a daggers to the left and all the a's to the right. So I replace this by a dagger squared, a squared, and then plus the commutator is 1, so that's plus a dagger a. Okay. So n squared is equal to the normally ordered n squared plus n. Is that clear what this notation means? Because it can be confusing. This symbol, double dot, says take, you know, if I look at what n The normally ordered version of x squared, not the normal, but this symbol means 
turn off commutation relations, pretend they're C numbers, move all A daggers to the left and A's to the right. Close your eyes to the fact that they don't commute and just do it. Okay? And that's what I did. So this is what that symbol means. It's an algebraic relation. This does not equal this. This equals this. Okay? It's very important. So, with that said, I can now look at what this is. Delta n squared, in this case, is equal to the normally ordered version of n squared plus, or I'll just write it as <coughs> minus n squared minus plus n. Okay, so I just replaced that with that and rewrote it. Okay, now everything here is normally ordered, right? Because n is a normally ordered operator of its own. So, this then is equal to um, the average of Expectation value of this, well, I use this formula here, and then that should be, just became alpha star squared and alpha squared, which I wrote as the magnitude of alpha squared squared. For reasons that are clear, this now represents the average of alpha squared to the squared minus the average of alpha squared squared plus n. You got it? So what we see here is that the fluctuation in photons, photon counts for that single mode is equal to the fluctuation in intensity plus n. So, if this is an honest to God probability distribution, then this variance has to be non-negative, which means that this is always greater than or equal to n. And as we discussed last semester, and I re-emphasize here, we interpret this now as two contributions to the fluctuations that we would see in photon counting. One is the fundamental Poisson fluctuations that we would see in the semi-classical theory, just from the point of view that we have random photon counting. In addition, now, if the, the, we have a noisy intensity, like the intensity coming out of this uh, light bulb, which is fluctuating and different at different times, then we will see additional fluctuations in the photon count. So in some sense, this is wave noise, from wave. which could be zero if I had a perfect we stabilize intensity like out of a laser beam, not a really good one. Okay. Um, so one signature we have of classical versus non-classical is classical light is Uh, super Poissonian. In other words, the fluctuations can never be less than the 
what we would get for a Poisson distribution. Okay, it would, the border there is Poisson. Okay, but non-classical light, a space signature of non-classical light is that if we saw fluctuations that were less than the Poisson. If it was less than that, that state could not be expressed as a statistical mixture of coherent states with the classical statistics. It would require negative probability. In order for this to be negative, to subtract off from that. It's the only way that that could be true. And so that is an example of a, a, a state of light that would exhibit that feature such that I, my, my fluctuations were less than that could not be thought of as arising from a classical current source. And that is a signature of non-classical light. It's not a requirement that the light be this be non classical. But there could be other signatures. For example, we have the, the issue of bunching versus anti bunching. So if I looked at a, two, a correlation of two photons, I looked at a G2 experiment with two photodetectors and looked at the photon. Uh, coincidence with that. as a function of tau where we have a single argument this is tau is equal to the difference in the time between the two photon counts in our picture over here where we had this there would be a t1 and it, there would be two times and I'm looking only at the difference between them so for photon bunching or entropy so if we have what we showed, and I won't read the bio here today, but under the assumption of a P representation with classical probability, classical light, the, prob the rate of the joint detection at the same time is always greater than or equal to the detection where they're separated from the magnitude of tau. And that, we say, is the light is bunched. That is to say, the photons arrive clumped together. Now, that bunching can be thought about in terms of statistics of statistical waves. The extra fluctuation in the intensity gives rise to an extra fluctuation that looks like bunch photons. We can also think about that, as we discussed, as a kind of Bose statistics. Because the fact that the photons are bosons in a kind of thermal-like state, they, you have more probability due to the Bose statistics compared to Boltzmann statistics or Fermi statistics for the photons to be together. Okay. Yes, sir? Going back to the wave noise, this is short, sort of a measure of kind of how incoherent your source That's is. That's correct. Because the laser beam is still classical and it's very close to the Poisson. That's correct. Because it is coherent. That's correct. So it's, it's, there is a, that's why these, is called, these are called coherence functions, indeed. Right. Um, if, This is true. We say that we have anti-punching. And that is non-classical. If they're equal, we're on the border. For coherent state, as you know, there's no correlation. That's you will always see random stream of photons. 
with complete Poisson statistics, in that case, these guys for this would be flat, no matter what the separation of the time is. Um, now, as I mentioned in the past, we can have a situation, for example, where we observe anti-bunching, but have still super Poissonian statistics. Uh, it's not, they are not if and only if, but any one of these effects, the, in this case these two effects that were mentioned so far, are sufficient in order to say the state is not representable in terms of a positive P representation and thus classical light. In fact, the first experiment that M showed non-classicality showed anti-bunching. That was the famous Jeff Kimball's PhD thesis uh, in 1977, I believe. Um, okay, now let me just remind us about some of, uh, of the states of light we've looked at so far and how they relate to these properties. There are kind of three states we've talked about so far. We have a coherence state. Which has Poisson statistics. And neither bunched nor anti-bunched. It's on the border. Okay? In other words, it's the equality sign. We still call it classical in that case. Uh, let me Okay? Um, so for the single mode, Alpha, of course, the mean number is just the classical intensity, square of the amplitude. The fluctuations are equal to that. That's Poisson, right? This has a Poisson distribution. The probability of counting n photons in the mode is given by the Poisson distribution. And if I were to look at photon counting, it would look like a Poisson process, which I can't quite draw. You know, it'd be some random, I mean, it's supposed to be completely, everything is random. There's no correlations between them. If I had a beam incident on a photon counter, I would see kit clicks with a Poisson process as a function of time. If I could think about a Fox state, a Fox state is an eigenstate of the number operator. A Fox state has um, what fluctuations in photon number? Zero. It's an eigenstate. So this is, of course, as sub as you can get. Um, and if I try to write this as a p-representation, maybe I don't remember if we're going to do that for homework or not. We can, we can try. We could try to do that then what we will find is this is not a good probability distribution. It's horribly singular, uh, singular and negative. We can try to write it down, formally speaking, 
And I think it's like nth order derivatives of delta functions. Um, what we mean by such a state from the point of view of a beam is to say, you know, I have some, you know, time windows here, and I might have exactly one photon in each. This is an n equals one Fox state. And this is perfectly anti-bunched in this case. I might have two photons in each mode that would still be, this is an n equals two, but these are still, we would say that this is, can exhibit anti-bunching. Yes, sir? Can we observe uh, the party state in experiment? Um, we could try. Uh, people are sure trying to make sources that emit this you know, stream of photons where we have exactly one photon in a time window. It's, an important, you know, it's a very active area of, um, of research in quantum optics. How do you create such a source? It's a hard thing. People have gotten closer to doing this, photon, single photons on demand with sources, how you excite those, the, the, you know, what is the current source, so to speak, or what is the source that gives rise to it? I can't just, a laser is not the right source. But we're going to think about some ways in which you might be able to do that. Yeah? What about the heralded photon mm -hmm. experiment that you talked about last semester? Like the sure. That's a perfect, that is indeed one way to post-select out a source that would be uh, a good single photon source. That's the, the, probably the thing that's done the most in terms of trying to access, um, for example, single photon sources is to use this kind of heralded photons. How off what the heralding rate is and what the probability of the heralding is what typically limits the viability of that is a good source, and people would like to get around that, and that's where the research is at. We'll talk more about it actually again this semester. Right, um, and then we were talking also, we have talked, and you're looking in your homework, about reminding us about thermal light or what's sometimes called chaotic light, or what's sometimes called natural light. So light from stars, black body radiation. If I put it through some spectral filter and I look at only certain a certain frequency band, then I would say that that light represents thermal light, or natural light. And that light is not a pure state. That is, of course, if it's a thermal state, I can express it in terms of a Boltzmann distribution with a certain temperature. Okay, there's an effective temperature. That effective temperature is related to uh, the mean number of photons according to the Planck distribution. So if I have, uh, for example, a single mode at a certain frequency, H is the Hamiltonian, and I could, if I want, put in the zero point energy. It's irrelevant. It plays no role in the state once I normalize things with the partition function. Then, as we, you're reminding yourself, the mean number of photons is given by the Planck distribution. And the problem, this state can be expressed as a statistical mixture of Fox states 
with a Bose-Einstein distribution. Representation of the same quantum state. And as we showed last semester, and you're reminding yourself in homework, this is a Gaussian distribution. With a variance in the intensity equal to um, that square. So, according to this general formula, over here, thank you, uh, um, the, what we would expect then is that the fluctuation in the photon number is equal to what? statistics, looking at the average, if I look at the average of n squared minus the average of n squared, I get that for a Bose-Einstein distribution. And in fact, Einstein noted that right away when looking at his statistics with his friend Bose, that um, the fluctuations exhibited a contribution that he called the wave contribution and the particle, the wave-particle duality, appeared. Um, very good. Um, and what else do I want to say about this? Um, right, and of course, you know, this exhibits bunching. And you know, I can't draw that well, but this would be bunched if I had a multi-mode case. And again, I can think about that in terms of the Bose statistics. Great. So, let me see if I'm missing anything else I wanted to say. No, I think that's good. So now I, what we want to do is think a little bit beyond photon count as the only way we can measure or analyze the light. And in thus thinking about other ways, signatures we might have of non-classicality in our electromagnetic field.
So, in modern parlance in quantum optics, people think about talk about different kinds of degrees of freedom associated with the quantized field. One talks about so-called discrete variables, which have to do with photons, particles. Or one talks about continuous variables. So in particular, if I think about n as one observable, I'm talking about the photons, how many photons, this is a discrete value variable. It has discrete eigenvalues. But one can also think about continuous variables, it's often written as CV. Uh, and there I think about waves, in which case the degrees of freedom I'm thinking about are things like the quadratures. X and P, which have continuous eigenvalues. So what can we say about the nature of these quadratures um, whether or not the light is representable as a statistical mixture of coherent states or not? Is it a classical state or not? What are the implications for the waves? Well, we can look at that pretty quickly. So um, let's just quickly remind ourselves for a coherent state. What is the expected value of x? Well, let me just remind you, of course, x is a plus a dagger over root 2, and p is a minus a dagger over i root 2. Okay. The root 2 here is a particular convention as we've written such that x commuted with p is i and not i over 2. h bar is effectively 1 in these units. Okay. So what is this equal to? It's related to the real part, right? This is alpha plus alpha star over root 2. Right? Because the A hits it to the right, gives me an alpha. The A dagger hits it to the left, gives me an alpha star, which is equal to the root 2 times the real part of alpha. And the expected value of P is similarly related to the imaginary part of alpha. alpha is thus some variable x plus i p. It's the complex amplitude, right? Okay, what about the fluctuations in x and p? Well, the variance is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. So how are we going to find the expected value of x squared? Right, exactly. Right in terms of equation annihilation operators. And then commute them such that they're in normal order, right? So. This is equal to, so the expected value of x squared is equal to a squared plus a dagger squared plus 
a dagger a plus a a dagger over two. Right? And then I just reordered this by commuting by commuting this in the other order, which gives me in these units of the quadrature x squared is a half. And similarly, it's very easy to see by exactly the same procedure that this is a half. And so this is a minimum uncertainty state of the RMS is the minimum value. So a coherent state is a minimum uncertainty state, and each of them has fluctuations 1 over root 2 in, in RMS. So what about for a general classical state. Written as a statistical mixture of coherent states where this is a classical probability. What can you say about these fluctuations? Well, in that case, I'm going to have a statistical mixture of this guy, right, for a statistical mixture of coherent states. And so the fluctuation in the quadrature is going to be the fluctuation in that plus a half. In other words, there's a classical wave fluctuation in the quadrature, and the fundamental term here coming from commutivity. So this is always greater than or equal to a half. It's equal to a half for a coherent state, and only a coherent state. And for anything else that is a statistical mixture of coherent states, it is going to be have additional fluctuations in the quadrature. And that's true also for P. So another signature that we would say exhibits non-classicality is if this is less than a half. Um, but let, so if x squared or p squared fluctuations are less than the vacuum level, then this is non-classical. Cannot be explained in terms of a statistical mixture of coherent states. And that state, of course, is known as a squeeze state of light. which is what we're going to study for the next few lectures. Okay. Uh, let me remind us, in order to do this, to, to look at this carefully, we need to develop some uh, 
algebraic skills in manipulating continuous variable operators. Okay? There's a whole algebra associated with it, some of which we've already seen. So, um, the most important operator that we that we really need whose properties we need to uh, review and develop more is the face face place displacement operator. So, as we know, momentum is the generator of displacements along position, and position is the generator of displacements in momentum. And if we want to displace in position and momentum, we have to include both. So we write the unitary operator that displaces me by x and p simultaneously without biasing whether I do x or p because they don't commute is the following operator, e to the minus i, x, p hat, minus p, x hat. p is the generator of x displacements and minus x. This is generator of p displacements, and it's always e to the minus i. Okay. This is, of course, a unitary operator. Often we express this in terms of A and alpha using the relationships written over here to write this as a function of just one variable alpha, which is both x and p, as e to the alpha a dagger minus alpha star a. Memorize that. Don't get the sign wrong. Know where the star is. Know this. This is your friend. Okay. Yes, sir? So, e to the i, all that, has both real and imaginary parts, right? Or is it purely... This operator over here is permission. Right. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, does this rotate us in phase space? No, or it, it also does not. Fail? It just displaces. Just displaces. It just displaces. Okay. So, it takes whatever, if I have any distribution in phase space, let me just, to not confuse the general variable by a specific choice of that, okay, just as a at any distribution in phase space, what this operator does is it displaces that is we're supposed to not distort it at all. So right. imagine this is a rigid body by the amount of alpha not. Okay. If I had if alpha not were real, it would just displace along the x-axis. Because that's what this operator does. It is a displacement along the x-axis by an amount x naught generated by p. In wave mechanics, p is the derivative operator, and that's just the statement of the Taylor series expansion. If you like wave mechanics the right way. Um, and this is the derivative respect to momentum, which is the generator of the Taylor series for displacing p. So, yes, thank you for that. We're going to talk about the rotations in a moment. Yes? The relation between alpha naught and x naught and p naught, will that be alpha naught equal to x naught plus i p naught? Correct. Yeah. Now, because I don't want to drag along a bunch of knots, I'm going to take it away again. Excuse me, but that's like. Okay. Right. Um, so, one of the ways we see that this is a displacement operator algebraically is to note that if I look at the unitary transformation 
on the operator conjugating A with that unitary, right? That's a unitary transformation on the operator. What does that equal to? And if you don't know, how would you figure it out? Yes, Mark, I'm listening. What did you say? A plus alpha. A plus alpha. Now, if we didn't read, that's correct. It displaces A that way. How would we derive that? Baker of Campbell. Baker Campbell. Thank you, sir. Right? You remember that E to the A, B, E to the minus A is equal to the sum over N multiple commutator of uh, A with B n times over n factorial, right? Where that just means A commuted with B n times. Everyone needs to know that, okay? And similarly, we can see thus that if I look at the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian parts of this, that this unitary transformation displaces x according to the real part of alpha and displaces p according to the imaginary part of alpha. These are all very useful relations. In fact, this is one way we could have derived the fluctuations knowing what they are for the vacuum using this uh, kind of result. Um, right. of the sum of operators that this is equal to e to the a, e to the b, plus e to the minus one half, the commutator of a and b, if, if the series truncates, meaning that this guy commutes with a and b. So, what that tells me is that B of alpha is equal to, if I call this A and this B, is equal to E to the alpha A dagger, E to the alpha star minus alpha star A times E to the minus a half alpha squared. Right? To do a little bit of algebra. And this, by the way, just as a little aside, keep this in mind, is the normally ordered displacement operator. Do you agree with that? Sure, because all it means is ignore the commutation relations and put all, so what I'm going to do, if I could ignore the commutation relations, I just treat them like C numbers, but I keep the A daggers on the left and the A's on the right. Keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, but, but I digress, and I do that often. Um, the, what we see thus, though, is that the coherence state is a displacement on the vacuum. And the vacuum itself, of course, is a coherent state with eigenvalue zero. So all coherent states are connected to all other coherent states through a displacement. How do I see that? Well, let's just check. And one way to do it is we want to know what is the 
we want that this guy is an eigenvector of the annihilation operator. So let's look at the action of A on this state. That is A acting on the displaced vacuum. Right? So how would I do that? I need to get A to the other side because I know what happens with A. But using this guy, I mean, there's different ways to say it. I can write it in terms of a commutator. But I can shove in here a D, D dagger because D is permission, I mean, is unitary. That's the identity, right? The dagger is the identity. And now what? Well, this is equal to, according to the expression we have on the board down there, A plus alpha acting on the vacuum. Right? But A acting on the vacuum is the null vector, it's zero. So when I'm, and this is just a number, so it moves through the operator, and that is equal to that, which is equal to that. So voila, this thing is indeed an eigenvector of the annihilation operator with eigenvalue alpha. We also can use this expression to quickly see how um, uh, this, this state is a superposition of Fox states. So if I use this expression given this normally ordered product, then this is equal to e to the minus alpha squared over 2, e to the alpha a dagger, e to the minus alpha star a acting on the vacuum, just using this equality that we derived from Baker Campbell Hausdorff, right? And now what? Well, this guy I can write as a power series. And every time A acts on the vacuum, what happens? It's zero. So that means the only surviving term is one. So this is equal to e to the minus alpha squared over 2 e to the alpha a dagger. This is how some algebraic people like to write coherent states. This is the bargain form if you ever care to know. But that's another digression. Um, and now what? Well, now I can express this in terms of a superposition from the uh, power series expansion. expressing this operator as a power series in this argument. The alpha to I made the alpha, thank you. I need the alpha to the end. That's very important. And now what? Well, if I divide by the square root of n factorial, just separate that out, this is the n fox state. And so this is equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity, alpha to the n over square root of n factorial e to the minus 1 half alpha squared n. And it's a superposition of Fox states with those amplitudes. Memorize it. Every once in a while, it's just have some things that you can have at your fingertips. That's one of them. So, with that said, the probability of finding n photons in the mode is the sum of cn squared is alpha squared to the power n over n factorial e to the minus alpha squared, which of course is equal to the average n to the n over n factorial e to the minus average n, which is the Poisson distribution as expected. Just another algebraic way to get to the same point. Okay. 
Now I want to address the point that Zach raised, which is, has to do with rotations in phase space. Not rotations in 3D space, but rotations in phase space. So if I have a phaser in phase space, I can look at rotations um, generator of rotations in phase space. Yes? What's that? The number operator. The number operator, indeed, because that's just simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion is just the part that if I start here, it goes in a trajectory in phase space, right? That's simple harmonic motion. The Hamiltonian is x squared plus p squared over 2, or a dagger a plus a half. Right? If I don't really care about the one half part, then uh, as Andrew said, the number operator is the generator of rotations. So we, I will call r of theta either the minus i theta n half. And so, according to the unitary transformation, which I can think about if omega is, so then I would have h bar omega, of course. Then this is e to the minus i theta. If I didn't remember that, well, I could use this. Right? That's how you generally derive how a unitary transformation works. That's another way of saying the Heisenberg picture. If this, this would be the time evolution operator, if this were e to the minus i ht, right? That's the same thing. And then this would be the time evolution operator, which generates those rotations. And I leave it as a fun exercise for you to show that if I look at the rotation by omega t, which is on alpha, that is the unitary time evolution acting on this, up to the zero point energy that I don't care about, this is equal to this. Now, I caution you and I urge you not to get confused to say that this is equal to that. X nay no way yet no. That is not true. Not in the least. Except that t equals zero. Um, this state is a coherent state with eigenvalue alpha, has that overall phase. If that were a energy eigenstate with eigenvalue h bar omega, then it would be that. But it's not. Fox states have this kind of thing for n equals 1, but not coherent states. 
This is a different a state with a different eigenvalue of alpha. You can't take the, this outside the cat. That's not the same thing. Okay. It was like I was seeing on Twitter. This math professor was, uh, you know, as saying that n over log n does not equal one over log. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, all right. Um, it's a little more sophisticated than that, but hey. Um, so, for example, um, If I look at the rotation operators, how a unitary transformation acts on the quadratures, well, that's just the rotated version of x. And similarly, which we sometimes call x of theta. And the rotated version of P by a two by two rotation matrix in phase space. Obviously, a unitary transformation does not change the commutation relations. So these guys satisfy the same commutation relations at any x and p. So we think about these guys, if this is the reference phase, the rotated guys are these quadratures. I do, I mean sign, yeah. And actually here, I mean it the other way direction because I'm going uh, clockwise rather than counterclockwise. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, it's then easy to see that if I look at a the fluctuation in uh, quadrature for a given coherent state that these guys are equal no matter what they do using the fact that I can just shove in an R dagger R and look at it what it was at the reference phase and they're both equal to a half. Which is to say that a coherent state is a state which has some mean field, which we write here in terms of alpha. So here I'm looking at it. Um,
And that uncertainty bubble is supposed to be a circle. Meaning that it doesn't matter what quadratures I'm looking at, the fluctuations are the same along any quadrature. Okay? So this state, no matter what I'm looking at, has a RMS of 1 over root 2. No matter what. Okay? What that says is that as a function of time, as this undergoes simple harmonic motion, well, if I were to look at it as a function of time, it starts, you know, maybe at time t equals zero, it starts here, and then it, you know, it undergoes some. Um, that's the mean field. Okay? This is the mean x as a function of time, just undergoes simple harmonic motion, right? As this thing undergoes that kind of uh, trajectory. However, in addition to this, there are fluctuations. But the fluctuations have the same variance, or RMS, no matter what phase I'm looking at. So at all instances, at any phase quadrature, this is equal to 1 over root 2. In other words, the projection of this bubble onto the x-axis is the same at all times. Okay. Now I'll just conclude, and we'll pick it up next week, is that a squeeze state is one such that the fluctuations uh, in some quadrature for some theta is less than half for some theta. Okay. And typically, when the squeeze states that we're talking about are the pure squeezing, are such that they're also minimum uncertainty states. which means that for, if for some theta this is less than 1 over root 2, for that theta p it's got to be greater than 1 over root 2. So a squeeze state might look like this. That is a state which has reduced uncertainty below the vacuum level along this quadrature, but according to the uncertainty principle, it must then have the anti-squeezed along the conjugate quadrature. What such a state would correspond to in this case would be one such that at this point, the noise is very little. But at this point, the noise is very big. So it has a kind of distorted uncertainty. I'll draw this better next time. So the noise is phase dependent. When this thing is right on axis, at when I'm measuring x, it has very little noise. I can see when it crosses the x-axis. But on the p-axis, later, at some other time, it might be along here. So this would be what we would call an amplitude squeeze state. Because the amplitude is very well defined. But the phase is very undefined, because I can't see when it goes to zero. Alternatively, I could have a phase squeeze state, one where I know exactly what the phase is. Not exactly, but I've improved my certainty on what the phase is, and I've traded that off with 
a bigger uncertainty in what the amplitude is. Such a state cannot be obtained from a classical light source. So what we're going to talk about next week is, A, how do we describe these states algebraically? What are their properties? And how would we even measure this? Because this is not related to the number of photons, but something about the continuous variables. So we're going to talk about what kind of measurements. And then from there, we're going to talk about how much you actually generate such a thing. What are the sources? Excuse me. All right. That's where we're headed. All right. We'll conclude there. Have a good afternoon, everyone.